So first I'd like to thank uh, the organizers and uh, um, the entire city for being incredibly great hosts. This is a wonderful venue and I've had the opportunity for the last three days to walk around the city and see it and it's been just great. So a big hand, thank you so much. So uh, Lauren and I are gonna tag team this talk. I'm gonna speak for a few seconds uh, about the motivation and then I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren who's gonna talk about the uh, methodology we've used to look at this question uh, and give you some of the results that have come out and it's just gonna be a small sample of the results because there are many. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap it up with um, what kind of policy recommendations this has led to, in, at least in my college at Carnegie Mellon. So the motivation for this study goes back to uh, the original meeting of the Global Learning Council in Pittsburgh where it was decided by the working group there that we should really have some kind of a repository of what are the best practices, what are the things we know about how to use technology-enhanced learning uh, to really improve educational outcomes in an effective way at scale. And uh, that led to a working group um, that was led by Carnegie Mellon but was um, involving people contributing from all over the world uh, and a paper, uh, the title of whom was Teaching Te Technology Enhanced Learning Best Practices in Data Sharing in Higher Education that's on the GLC website now and is available to all. And um, the thing that uh, drove us to this project after that was, well, there's this big gap between what we think we know about how to do this work and how to actually improve learning outcomes and what we observe that's happening in the classroom in practice at universities like Carnegie Mellon and other universities uh, all over the world in higher education. What we hoped, uh, uh, what we have hoped for at least 20 or 30 years now that the research is moving along, uh, is that all these insights into how learning happens effectively um, would be widely adopted and uh, um, lead to sustained and improving innovations in teaching and learning. But what we've observed that it, that's not what's happening. That there's an, there's an awful lot of resistance in a lot of different forms for uh, innovations that we know work to be adopted in higher education and I'm sure in other institutional cultures as well. So what we really try to look at is what are the barriers? What are the barriers to adoption um, at institutions like ours? And um, they turn out to be not only institutional, but cultural. Uh, and the other topic that came out of the GLC working uh, group in Singapore when we met last was what are the um, factors that involve culture that make a difference in terms of how these things play at an institutional level? Uh, and what are the roadblocks to um, uh, instructional adoption that are institutional and culture. So tomorrow you're going to hear about a different project um, that was also commissioned by the GLC uh, a year and a half ago, which was to investigate the cultural influences. And so this working group did a wonderful literature review of all the different things we think we know. And they also did field trips to Africa where they actually tested out educational technology in the field uh, and had a really interesting experience doing so. So that's tomorrow's uh, talk by Amy Ogan and Judith. So. Um, we asked the question in a more limited fashion because we couldn't really do this research in a serious way in a broad fashion, but as a start, we said, what are the roadblocks at Carnegie Mellon, which is you know, uh, a research university uh, that has done in this area of learning science research some of, I think, the best work in the last 20 or 30 years, and so this was a really frustrating uh, um, fact that we've done the research, but we're not actually using this research in our own classrooms. Right. We have uh, an online course in statistics that's been tested by many, many other people and found to be uh, incredibly effective. It's teaching students in half the time and they're learning twice as much. And our own statistics department, which is under my college, so it's under my purview, doesn't use this online course, which was a source of real frustration and embarrassment to me. But let's not focus on my uh, a lack of effectiveness as a dean. <laughs> We asked, what is the general problem at Carnegie Mellon? Uh, and so uh, my colleague, Joel Smith, who, who took on this project that was funded by the Carnegie Corporation uh, and the Simon Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, Joel had this great suggestion, which was, well, look, if we want to get serious 
about understanding why we are not adopting this at an institution like Carnegie Mellon, right, then we have to actually get serious about it. We have to do some actual anthropology. So Joel had the brilliant idea of let's go out and hire a real anthropologist. We did. This is Lauren Herkus. And Lauren has spent uh, about a year and a half investigating in a very detailed set of methods what is going on at Carnegie Mellon. And so she's going to tell you that now, and then I'm going to generalize it into a plea for something a little bigger. Thank you. So an anthropological approach is really a human systems approach. And human systems are incredibly complex. Culture is very complex. And when we think about cultural differences, we often think about these really profound differences that are shaped by differences in language or things that you'll hear quite a bit more about, in fact, in tomorrow's presentation. These deep differences can shape the way that people experience the world, the way that they teach, the way that they learn, the way they, they interact with colleagues. So this is a little bit more obvious when we're talking about differences between two different countries. But even within an individual institution, there's a great deal of variation. People are, are different from one another in lots of different ways. And while you might be able to take an average height, an average opinion is much less useful. Opinions exist side by side. Attitudes and approaches exist side by side. And one of the big challenges, as I understand it, of administration is to figure out how to navigate these very complex landscapes of lots of different opinions and ways of doing things. So how do we grapple with these kinds of diverse approaches and perspectives? Well, anthropology's signature move is ethnography. Uh, ethnographic methods are a way of being present without being invested in a particular viewpoint or standing from a pr the perspective of a of an individual uh, stakeholder, but instead to step back, take a, a bird's eye view, a third party perspective, and understand how the myriad moving parts fit together. So no system, whether we're talking about a large cultural system or an individual classroom, whether we're talking about a department or an institution, exists in isolation. So in addition to looking at the system within a given small context, we also need to keep in mind local, regional, national, and global systems that also affect the cultural system that we're looking at. Now, one of the uh, kinds of side effects of, of being deeply invested in our own cultural perspective, every one of us has our way of doing things and understanding the world that seems innate and natural, and so goes unquestioned, even though it might be profoundly different from the way that others approach it which also means that changes in one part of a system can create cascading changes throughout the system and, and create changes in places that might be completely unexpected, unanticipated, and therefore a little more challenging to grapple with. So we took a mixed methods approach, employing, of course, ethnography, um, which means that I uh, spent a good part of a year getting deeply involved with four separate efforts to develop, design, implement, use, iteratively improve, and scale different uh, tell interventions, different technological solutions to problems or innovations that were thought to be useful or, uh, or effective. So for example, one professor has long thought that it would be really useful for incoming students in his program to go through a, an online module before they even arrive on campus. That way, when they get to campus, they'll all be more or less on the same page, and faculty will have a, a better sense of where those incoming students are, what they already know, and where they might need a little extra help. So he's had this idea, and in order to realize it, needs to create some content, work with programmers, develop effective cognitive tutors for the right context, see this deployed effectively, used by students, see how faculty deal with the data that results from this project or this, this module, and then figure out what to do with it and whether to improve it for the next year, the next batch of students. In the context of this effort, I spent a lot of time sitting in on meetings, usually very quietly, uh, being copied on email chains, interviewing people from the originator of the idea to the programmers, to the students who engaged with it, to the advisors of the incoming freshmen. And, um, trying to take that step back, 
and see what was happening systemically. So over the course of a year, we followed four efforts. We also administered a quantitative survey of faculty, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And then we used the results of these two methodological components to inform the construction of a series of semi-structured interviews. So we interviewed several dozen individuals, faculty at Carnegie Mellon, about some specific um, factors, things that had emerged from the earlier work that we really wanted to dive into more deeply and understand um, on their own and also in relation to one another. So to tell you a little bit more about the survey, we used a, a fractional factorial approach. So we would tell people stories like this one. Dr. Song, a colleague from another department, comes to you for advice. She has an idea for a module that she wants to develop over the next two months, which could improve student performance in her class. How many hours a week do you think is a reasonable commitment for Dr. Song to make to this effort? So this is actually a really complex story. We can vary different parts of it. Is this her own idea? Or did someone else develop it, test it, and prove it effective, this intervention? Is this going to benefit student performance? Is this going to reduce her workload? What, what is the benefit of this? So there are a lot of different variables here that can be um, affected. And in the analysis, we can disentangle them. And this allows us to, to really get at some of those preferences that faculty might have that they may not even be aware of. They might not, if you ask them straight out, they may not realize that they're favoring some things over another, or they may, or they may report differently because you know, they have their own priorities that are affected by their colleagues and their experience with their dean or someone else. So this is a, a technique that's often used to get at things like implicit biases, things like racism. In this context, we're trying to understand what motivates faculty, whether they're motivated more by some factors than by others, and whether this differs, th with what they, differs from what they might report. So for example, one of the things that was varied in these vignettes is this idea that um, you can dedicate time and energy towards developing a new idea that is your own, or you can develop time and energy to adopting something that's been developed and perfected by someone else. And across the board, we found that faculty were much more likely to dedicate more time and energy or to prioritize developing an original idea than to adopting something that was tested and proven in the past. So using this kind of approach, we can get a sense of the, the kinds of underlying systemic causes that allow us to identify patterns of behavior that we see, that, that create the kinds of challenges that we actually encounter, and to help us understand why we see some of the effects that we see. So one of the things that's been mentioned several times today and is frequently cited in the literature is faculty resistance. How do we change faculty's mindset? You know, why do faculty push back? How do we get them to do these things? But that's a very challenging concept to grapple with because it derives from a lot of different places. Two different quotes from interviews that took place over the last year or two. You can't do this without continuous support unless you devote your life to it, this being the development of new educational technologies. I love education, I love this sort of stuff, but I don't want to give up my other intellectual interests. As it is, I spend at least a full day every week on this. And another faculty member says, if a change goes even slightly badly, you're, not going to have, you're going to have 200 students complaining about an instructor that's not tenured. I mean, this is a disaster. Now, both of these represent faculty resistance. But that resistance comes from very different places. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we found. Now, these are four, I'm going to describe four different frameworks or underlying systemic effects that can create these kinds of ripples throughout the system that we're discussing. This is a fraction of our findings, and I'm happy to talk more about methodology or other results you know, in discussion afterwards. But for this talk, I'm going to describe these four. Cycles out of sync, adopting others' modes of teaching, risks of innovation, and the complexity of human collaborations. So when we're talking about cycles out of sync, we really mean this kind of temporal misalignment. In general, faculty members enter the academy at different points. First, they are students themselves. Eventually, they become graduate students, where they may practice teaching a little bit. Then they become new professors, where they develop their practice, and then perfect it 
and over time, they leave the professorate. So faculty are constantly coming into practice at a particular point in their own careers, and when they first encounter teaching as a practice, the institution is at some state, but that state changes constantly. Classrooms are renovated, software is updated, phased out and phased in. The kinds of pedagogical support that is available uh, changes with time. The kinds of institutional structures within which faculty are embedded change with time. And every institution exists within a larger context where technology and philosophies of teaching, ideas about technology or about integration of practice are also changing. So over time, these cycles get out of sync. Our student who learned how to teach using certain technologies finds that they become unavailable eventually. The institution phases out certain technologies and discovers that there are orphan technologies that are still floating around being used, no longer supported. Students come into a university exposed to certain kinds of ideas or certain kinds of technologies that aren't the same as those which are currently supported by the institution or employed by the faculty. So this misalignment can have profound effects. A couple of examples uh, in speaking to faculty of the kinds of effects that this might have include one faculty member who said, I used to use something called Flash, but Flash is outdated. Now there's Vimeo and other websites that make it easy, but does the university own them? What happens if you leave? There, there are these challenges, right? Another faculty member said, they didn't talk to any of the faculty who consistently used videotape. They just said, it's too old. They still get used on a re relatively regular basis, but as far as the university is concerned, it was old technology and gone. So we see these misaligned cycles having profound effects, but what can we do in an institutional context? Institutional support requires a whole lot of different moving parts, and that itself can be aligned within the institution to make sure that these are aligned with one another, these different uh, kinds of changes. And also, there should be an awareness that established faculty might be using a previous iteration of institutional support or familiar with, comfortable with, and reluctant to move from the familiar to something new, and that new technologies are familiar to incoming faculty and to students, which may not yet be supported by an institution. So the second uh, framework that I'd like to talk about is this idea of adopting others' modes of teaching, which which really relies on this, this fact that faculty have very strong mental models of teaching. Faculty have a sense of what good teaching is. In fact, every faculty member I've interviewed knows exactly what it means to teach well, even if they say, well, I don't know, then, then they will launch into an explanation of why they are so confident that they understand what it means to teach well. And this is often informed by personal experiences. People are students for a very long time before they ever get an opportunity to teach. And this really informs their sense of what it means to teach and to teach well. And even though many are exposed to uh, learning research, when your gut tells you to do one thing and an article you read tells you to do something else, it can be very challenging to overcome that gut sense of what it means to teach well. These experiences are often sitting in a classroom having a profound educational experience. Sometimes their parents or other mentors who are really uh, invested in teaching in one way or another. Uh, I heard more times than I can count, well, my mother was a librarian and she used to tell me this about teaching. Or my father, the professor, well, this is his approach. So if your idea about teaching well is deeply vested in content delivery, in delivering a really great lecture that's engaging and personal and something, anything, then that means that adopting content delivery that's developed by others or delivered by a technology or another person is not something that feels right to a lot of faculty. It conflicts with their mental model of good teaching. However, adopting other aspects of teaching, homework assignments, practice exercises, summative assessment, this doesn't conflict with the mental model of good teaching, and so is much easier to facilitate. 
One, inter one uh, professor I interviewed said, I had a professor when I was an undergrad, and I really enjoyed his lecturing style. I really paid very close attention. And I thought to myself at the time, if I ever have to teach, this is how I want to teach. So it goes way back to whenever 1975 or something like that. Now this is when I asked someone in 2016 how he teaches and why. So another faculty, when asked about you know, research on teaching and whether he was familiar with, uh, with all of the, the writing and research on teaching, said there are journals dedicated to it. There's communities out there. There's stuff on the web. There are a number of people who've written books, resources everywhere on people who've tried different things. Many of them actually try and do this in a rigorous sort of scientific way. I'm always a little skeptical of the data there. He clearly adopts what makes some intuitive sense to him and really appreciates the research, but it's very challenging to integrate some of those ideas if they conflict with his own sense of what's appropriate and what works. So the third system, or the th third framework I'd like to talk about is this uh, conflict between a desire for good student evaluations and promotion and tenure criteria. There's actually um, quite a bit written about the fact that um, student evaluations of teaching play a pretty big role in promotion and tenure in lots of different contexts, and that a desire to get good evaluations can negatively impact faculty willingness to innovate. It, it poses a risk. If your evaluations go down, then that you might suffer in promotion and tenure. One of the things that, um, that we've encountered is that student evaluations are one source for, for faculty uh, affirmation. Knowing that your students think that you're a good professor is really valuable to faculty. And thinking that your students might think that you're doing a bad, bad job is uh, really not very uh, appealing to most faculty. So in fact, there's, there's been a lot written about how we can affect promotion and tenure criteria in order to you know, reduce the impact of poor evaluations of teaching and improve faculty willingness to innovate. But in fact, it's this, this need for personal identity affirmation that is a much stronger effect in many cases. And alternative pathways for personal identity affirmation might actually uh, do more to promote innovation or to assuage fears of innovating uh, than changes to promotion and tenure criteria. I only have one quote for this one. <laughs> you're going to have to know how to use the system well enough that you're not an embarrassment to yourself in front of your students. That's your number one challenge. So the fourth framework that I'd like to describe is this complexity of human collaborations. No matter what effort, no matter what process we're talking about, it goes through stages over time. Someone innovates it, someone comes up with this idea and then it needs to be realized, tested, improved, deployed again. And at each stage of this, this operational chain, at each stage of this process, there are different people involved. Some of these people may be the same, but the context changes. The individuals involved change. And there's a lot of communication that has to happen in order to make this work well. Every one of these uh, collaborations, the relationship between each of these individuals is fraught. And a potential fail point. So the example I described earlier, the professor who decided that incoming students should have access to a module to complete before they arrive, uh, was working with a, a programmer who was helping him realize this vision. Now, the professor was really interested in kind of assessing where the students were in order to give that information to faculty. In fact, he said at one point, well, these, they're not our students yet. We can't really give them homework. I just kind of, I want them to have fun with it. I want them to have a sense of what they're going to come in with. And I want to know where they are when they get here. Now, this programmer had a really clear sense of what an online module would probably need to be based on instruction. In his mind, this is a course. The students needed to come out of this module having learned as much of this content as they could, so they come in in the fall with shared knowledge and kind of a baseline. And even though these two individuals spoke with one another many, many times over the course of the year that they were working together, this misunderstanding persisted and really shaped the kinds of uh, mismatched pedagogies that were realized in the module. 
and had effects later on for how the students felt about taking the module, how they felt about their future performance in their courses, whether they thought that they were up to the task of entering the program, whether the faculty could use the data that came out of the program as intended, and so on and so on. So these challenges um, are often very difficult to navigate for individuals, but often they don't feel very difficult to navigate because people don't realize that they're happening. This miscommunication often goes unnoted. Folks simply think that the other person is doing something that they don't quite understand, but not because they misunderstood that, that, um, that piece of information. So in much of the literature, we see recommended a, a champion. If you want to see this, this project realized, you need to make sure that you have a champion who can promote it throughout. Well, one function of a champion is to have this big picture in mind and to ensure that these kinds of communication are aligned. One of the reasons that a champion is so effective is because that person can mediate these uh, risks of coordination, communication, and collaboration. So these are four of many frameworks and a great number of factors that we encountered. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Richard to talk about what we can do about this. Thank you. Okay, so I am um, the leader of the Simon Initiative, but I'm also the dean of a college with many departments, and so I'm responsible for actually trying to move the needle on getting the students to learn more. Uh, and so Lauren and her research has given me lots of levers to pull, so I'm gonna just give you a brief couple of minutes description of what I hope to do with this, and then how this leads to, I think, a, a bigger project that we all have to engage in together. So, um, the challenge number three, the risks of innovation. You can see that the ideas that we usually have about getting people to want to innovate uh, at my level come around to, well, if people are getting dinged in the promotion and tenure process, then I have to relax the promotion and tenure process and say, look, if you're going to innovate, I will make sure that you will not be evaluated in the semester or the two semesters during the innovation, and so anything that happens in those semesters, that can't be used against you in a court of promotion and tenure. And uh, it turns out that that helps, but as you can see from the work Lauren has done, it doesn't help enough. And what we're learning from this, and I hope to implement is, and the usual strategy I take, I should mention as dean, is to offer faculty money, right? The incentive system that us deans usually work with is money, and I'm now a dean for three years, so I've been completely corrupted. <laughs> And, and I'm very accustomed to that as an incentive. And, and what this diagram shows me is I've got to stop worrying about money and worry about love. Yes? So we all, right, it's love we need to actually do. <laughs> so you can see the big red arrow on the left, which is the need for personal identity affirmation. We have to find a way to make the faculty feel love from the students, love from their heads, love from their deans, if they take the actual effort to do what we think works in getting the students to have educational outcomes to work. So I'm gonna have prizes that reward innovation for teachers. We're gonna have the heads give them affirmation and tell the teachers things like, don't worry about if the students hate you for a semester. Three years later down the road, they will come back to you and tell you it was the best thing they ever did. So you have to stick with it. Lots of things like that, but no money. Okay, number two, the challenge number two, I think revealed a very, very powerful a strategy that I can adopt as a dean, which is that you can't really succeed easily in getting faculty to adopt technology or other innovations that involve content delivery, because they have their own ideas about it and you're not gonna get them out of those ideas because they're so cemented in. But what you can do is give them uh, help in getting the students to have interactive exercises, to have grading, to have opportunities for being active as learners. And what we also know from learning science, which I'm sure you've all heard in many different contexts, is that lecturing at people like I'm doing at you is not as effective as getting you to be active and doing things to reinforce what you've just learned or to practice it to find out your misconceptions, et cetera. So it turns out that faculty are going to be, in our, if this research is, is going to predict what's gonna happen in the future, are going to be much more receptive to innovations in which we help them let the students become active learners, become right, involved in collaborative environments where they're actually 
uh, uh, being given good feedback uh, in lots of different ways, as opposed to give them lectures on video or other sources of content delivery that go against what the professor believes. And finally, for the challenge number four, the complexity of human collaborations, um, I, I think this is one that anybody who's been in business and has to manage a project or create a project that's to be managed will recognize that there's many, many points in a project's lifespan where the people who are involved in one stage of the project don't communicate very well with the people who are involved in later stages of that project. And that turns out to be a big risk for technology. So all too often as administrators and policymakers, we have incentivized faculty to come up with individual course innovations, individual uh, things, and then we wonder when they actually stop doing that and somebody else takes over the same course, why the innovation dies. Or whether they have the innovation and they actually go ahead and realize it, but then they turn it over to some other team to actually bring to the students at more at scale in a way it doesn't translate in the same way that they invented it and showed it to be successful. So we have to take much more seriously from the beginning the idea that we have to start a process and manage one that involves a project management scheme that will overcome these risks. So what I'm doing in my college is I'm going to identify three or four high impact courses. Intro to psychology, intro to economics, right? Intro to statistics, intro to writing. Things that, courses that infect many, many students and form a foundation for what follows It's critical. And then I'm going to go to those departments and I'm going to say, you have to take this on, not as a single faculty member, but as a team of faculty members in your department, a team of programmers that I support, a project management team that I support, an assessment team that I support. So this is going to be a five to ten year project which we're going to actually keep track of and manage throughout this time span. And instead of having a single faculty member take this on, it's going to be a team that we're all going to be right, responsible for and buy into uh, 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 going forward. So these are just a few of the different innovations um, in administration that I'm going to try to adopt as a result of Lauren's research. But, but what Lauren pointed out to me uh, about six months or a year ago was that there's a bigger issue here that we all have to take very seriously, which is that the kind of work that Lauren's doing is extremely rare and very, very um, underfunded in higher education, in lower education, in middle education, everywhere. And it's something that medicine as a field finally got their heads around maybe 20 years ago. And so we need to do the same thing in high, higher education. We need ears and eyes telling us what's happening on the adoption front, right, not just going by the seat of our pants and by our intuition. So in Madison, uh, there was a revolution, at least in America, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, where uh, um, the funding agencies uh, uh, began to push very hard on the idea that we have to actually treat patients on the basis of evidence-based practice, evidence-based studies. So, so the evidence-based medicine movement uh, became very popular. And there were all sorts of uh, institutional ways as a nation uh, uh, that America adopted this, and I'm sure this has happened in Europe uh, many times over, which was that um, um, many, many studies were done and, and, and the community began to really take seriously the idea of we had to evaluate what things work, what things don't work, as procedures, as drugs, etc. But it turns out that they discovered that even though you might know what works in terms of medicines and what works in terms of practice, that doesn't mean that the clinicians or the doctors are going to adopt what we know works. And so what they discovered were that um, they had to do something extra to get medical care to actually respond to what we do evidence-based research on. And that, that actually required forming a new science, which the medical community called implementation science. And this is exactly the kind of work that Lauren's doing, but in the medical community, looking at what are the practices, what are the institutional barriers in hospitals, in clinics, in doctor's practices that we have to actually facilitate overcoming in order to get these things we know work into practice. And that's been very successful, but it's taken a separate effort to fund and actually build into the institution. And we need to do the same thing in higher education and in all forms of education. So what we're going to do is close and then open the floor to questions is we really think that we need an implementation science for 
evidence-based higher education. And not only to actually figure out how to get institutions to change, but for us to monitor what's happening so we can adjust. So I'm going to take these changes that Lauren has found in Carnegie Mellon and apply them to my college. How I know that they work or they don't work, I've got to keep Lauren employed and find out if it's working and not working, and then adjust, and then move on. And our context in Carnegie Mellon is not the same as your context in your universities or your schools. Every context is local. And so we need people on the ground who are trained like Lauren is to tell us what is working to get the faculty to change and what is not, and how should we adjust. And that's what we'll stop with. There was a question on Twitter about whether this research is available and published somewhere. And Lauren, you want to answer that? We have, we have an interim report that's available um, for distribution. And there are several articles that are in preparation or in press. So we're also in the process of finalizing the thematic analysis from the semi-structured interviews, which is the, the final and complete analysis from the project. We anticipate that that will be complete within the next few months and available. So anyone who's interested in a copy of it, please let us know. You'll have to shout. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's a... Don't get, can we get in this? <laughs> Here. Oh, he's, he's got it, sir. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was truly enlightening, uh, so very, quite a few parallels to, to our case. And there's one question that I would uh, like to ask you. Uh, in your results, is something that you also found that uh, one of the key differences between higher education and primary and secondary education is that a lot of the lecturers, a lot of the professors teaching at universities do not have a formal pedagogic background. Because you were showing a picture earlier where you said, a lot of uh, the know-how, a lot of the teaching resources came from personal experiences during their time of, as a student. And obviously, we're talking about this morning that there are pedagogic concepts missing for the introduction of technologically, technologically enhanced science in teaching. And if that is already the case on primary and secondary level, where we have formally educated teachers, isn't that a much more amplified problem on the higher education front? I, I can answer one part of this and maybe talk, uh, ask Lauren to answer another. So uh, that's a great question because uh, we all realize that faculty are simply not given the formal training in how to teach. So at Carnegie Mellon, we've now implemented a faculty orientation program for all new faculty coming in. And we've had debates among the administration about how many days can we ask the faculty to endure of this training. And the answer was about two. <laughs> So, so far, we're going to try to squeeze in everything we can possibly tell the faculty about how to teach effectively in about two days of training. Now, that's not enough, right? And so we need to augment that with an ongoing, you know, let's make sure that there's a community of teaching that they can actually be a part of where they actually talk about what's working, they measure what's working, they talk to each other about best practices, and the thing gets, right? And we also need, I think, to create an expectation Right, that they will, they will be a part of that community, they will take it seriously, et cetera. But what, what I think Lauren will confirm is that the, te the, the professors at Carnegie Mellon and other places, they do take it seriously. They are very passionate and very dedicated to their teaching. But they have a very firm idea of what it is that might not be a, the same as what it should be. Yeah, I'll add to that that, um, that well, two things. First, even the folks who are really dedicated to learning about uh, evidence-based practices in teaching um, come to the professorate with very limited experience with that and are often charting their own course to educating themselves. There are resources available and, and people avail themselves of it, but this is still kind of a, a self-guided tour of effective teaching. There are some faculty who come in with an idea of effective teaching practice that's grounded in evidence. Uh, one person I spoke to described her formative moment in teaching when she was 
I believe in her second year of university, she was taking a class with a professor who she really respected. I think that this was the course that led her to, to her major, to her doctorate, to uh, a career in academia. She said she pulled the professor aside after class and, and said, I really admire your class. It's wonderful. It's really engaging. And the professor said, oh, thank you. I work really hard on every class meeting. I break up the class into these 15 to 20 minute chunks and I make sure to incorporate uh, activities and group work and multimedia presentations in every course. And this completely blew this young woman away. She had no idea that so much thought and preparation went into a class. She just assumed that that professor had something special, some kind of charisma and knowledge of the subject. Very few faculty have this kind of experience that informs the way they watch professors teach when they are studying themselves or think about their own teaching. Many more are like the quote that I presented who, you know, this, this professor had seen someone organize text on a blackboard and it really worked for him and so that's what he did. So exposure to these other ways, especially in those, those kinds of formative moments early in a faculty member's life or career, when they can start thinking about what this means for them teaching, are really valuable. I think we have time for one more question. Hi there. Um, just a quick practical question about the project. You mentioned there were four projects you were looking at. Um, could you just let me know um, how many of those actually were successes? And if not, you know, what were the thing, what were the, the fail points, as you mentioned earlier? So it depends on how you define success. <laughs> um, two of the four projects actually produced an intervention that was used in a pilot context and then subsequently with additional students in, a, in another context. Um, the other two are uh, still in development. Uh, all four of them uh, changed their goals in the course of the, the effort and changed their timelines in the course of the effort. So it really depends on how you measure success. Each of them has made progress uh, towards developing new approaches, new frameworks, and or new tools and technologies. Uh, so they were all successes. <laughs> I'll be a little more undiplomatic and say, no, two of them had huge problems. Uh, and they confronted the, the risks that she, she showed you here and did not overcome them successfully. All four of them grappled with all four of the challenges that, uh... Thank you so much. <laughs>